we'll get this relationship and uh, and so this is another line in the plane so let's just try and simulate this one let's go over here and uh, let's fit all this on one okay and uh, let's say from the first experiment this was k11 let's now take the second experiment as being k12 and here we have minus 8.002 divided by 4.123 times k2 and then plus plus um, 28.003 divided by 4.123 right so that's k12 uh, which is the second experiment uh, yeah th that's the set of uh, possibilities from the second experiment and uh, let's plot that one as well on the same set of axes so this is k12 we have to update this one as k11 so let's plot that ex01 and uh, now you see here there seems to be just one line on this plane and let's zoom in to see why that is let's just look at the small piece here and uh, you can see there's something going on and looking at it you can see that there are actually two lines in this plane but they are extremely close together they are very parallel and so we can't actually see a difference between those two lines here and uh, let's just zoom out so looking at all the uh, at the available solution space we can't actually see a difference between those two lines right now these lines are not perfectly parallel right because of this here right there's uh, some perhaps there's some inaccuracy in the measurement for uh, component B or uh, it, it might be that it is that accurate whatever it is um, that's the number we have um, and it, it causes this matrix not to be uh, or sorry these lines not to be perfectly parallel but uh, they are so close to being parallel that uh, we it, it's very difficult for us to detect where that solution might lie and uh, and so this is the problem of our matrix not being properly conditioned right the values in this matrix are such that we cannot tell uh, or we cannot have complete faith in the solution that we might get from this right so uh, let's illustrate this another way let's create this matrix C and for that let's just work in the command window so matrix C is and we said 1.123 for the first one 2.123 for the second one and uh, 4.123 in the bottom row followed by 8.12 uh, what was it 2 or 3 that was a 1 actually so that's our matrix C there and if we ask for the inverse of C and we multiply it by the rate then we should get the solution so let's put the rate in the rate was 7.123 for the first reaction and it was um, uh, where is it? and it was 28.003 for the second one so 28.003 for the second so that's our rate and we expect to get the uh, the kinetic rate constants by taking the inverse of C of C and multiplying that by R um, and you see that's the solution that we get there and uh, and you see there's, there's no complaint about this this appears to be a perfectly valid solution for um, for k right the values 1 and 3 seem to solve it but uh, let's try changing this now let's change the value here from uh, 8.001 to 8.002 so that's uh, on the second row in the second column so c 2,2 .2 is uh, instead of 8.001 let's make it 002 right so the matrix has changed slightly and let's ask for our new estimate for the kinetic rate constants and you see here there's a significant difference right the value for k1 has changed from 1 to 4 and the value for uh, k2 has gone from 3 to 
So there has been a, a very rapid change in that solution, and that was from a very small change in the matrix C. Right in our matrix C, we've only changed this last value here by a very small amount. Right, in fact, probably below the d detection limits of our uh, of our instruments. And so if we don't have uh, a high degree of, uh, of confidence in these numbers, then the solution is going to fluctuate rapidly. There's no way for us to tell the difference between this solution 1 and 3 and the solution 4 and 1.5. So this is a problem with the matrix being ill-conditioned. right? And we saw uh, geometrically this means that the, the two lines that we get from, uh, from that matrix are effectively are very close to being parallel and in other words the the solutions are very close together another way to look at it would be that if we were to move um, the the gradient of of any one of these two lines the intersection point between them would be the uh, would move rapidly along that line right that's maybe something we didn't uh, emphasize there that we said at first this single line was the uh, was the locus of possibilities for the solution K1 and K2, and by having a second line, uh, the intersection point would be that the single value, the the single possibility that would satisfy both experiments. And now we see that the experiment is such that if we change the value slightly, we'd be moving along this line very rapidly. So this is an ill-conditioned matrix and. Uh, Let's look at the other comments that we write here. So looking down here, um, so we can see that the lines are almost parallel. And so in this case, um, even without looking at that matrix, we could have said, look, I can see that these lines are going to be very close to parallel. Right? This is effectively 2. This is uh, very close to being 2. And then this is 7. And, and this is very close to being 7. So I can see from this that the equations are going to be parallel and I can't trust my solution here. Um, but uh, of course it's not always so easy to see that. right? Most of the time the uh, this parallelness is hiding somewhere in a linear combination of more than one set of rows. So we can't always see that the matrix is ill-conditioned. Um, quite often, uh, in fact, most of our matrices are not just two by twos, so it's much harder to detect for these other matrices. Um, fortunately, we have an easy way to compute the uh, the condition number for the matrix, and from your linear algebra, you should know that this is nothing but the ratio of the norm of the matrix multiplied by the inverse of the norm of that matrix. And in MATLAB, we can compute that quite easily as the norm, we can say here, norm of C times the norm of the inverse of C. And you can see that's a large number, um, which effectively tells us that this is an ill-conditioned matrix. If the numbers are small, if they're close to 1, then it's well-conditioned, and we can easily trust the solutions. So we should always do this check. What's the, the condition number for this matrix? If it's a large number, then we can say that there are uh, any number of solutions for, uh, for that set of equations. And we notice especially that there was no complaint from uh, the interpreter. right? When we asked for the inverse of C, uh, sorry, the inverse of C and multiplied it by R, then there was no complaint about this answer, right? Um, this appears to be a perfectly valid solution to us, and uh, only if we had gone in and checked the condition number for that matrix C would we have noticed that there might be some doubt around the solution. So that's why we should always just check that condition number to begin with. Now, what's the solution to this type of problem, right? How can we get around this? If we look back here, you see it's simply that we've uh, we've we've just varied the pressure, and uh, what we should have done was perhaps change the concentration of uh, any of those components independently. So let's say that instead of allowing component B to uh, to be at a value of eight, we simply chose a value of seven here. Then, if we were to plot this, right? I'm just changing the concentration for B to be seven. 
um, that's all I need to do. Let's look at uh, the lines that we get in this situation. So you can see here these lines are, are nowhere near as parallel as the others and so uh, a real solution does exist for us. In other words, we've chosen values such that the matrix is no longer ill-conditioned and um, and in this case we can have some some faith in the solution that we generate from this method and that is really the only way we have around this. There isn't some mathematical technique that can get us around this problem. It's simply the case that um, physically what we've done is we, we haven't collected the right sort of information to, uh, to obtain the, the kinetic rate constants and that's important to know. You see, this then influences our experimental design. We have to have an appreciation of the condition number of the matrices. We have to have an, an appreciation for the type of information that we collect in our experiments. Um, and we, we have to know whether our model is sensitive enough, right? This particular uh, rate expression here, is this rate expression sensitive enough to our experiment that we can uh, easily extract the parameters behind that model.